All right. Well, I just want to take the opportunity to go ahead and kick off today's show. We have Dan Hanford, one of the managing partners here at PassiveInvesting.com. Dan, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. We have got a full house. So everybody wants to hear all the ways <laughs> that they could possibly lose money through a passive investment. So what are those red flags? But before we launch into that, I just wanted to, we, most people here probably know you as a operator and as an active investor, but how did you get started into real estate? And more importantly, how did you get on the passive side of deals? Yeah. So I actually started uh, um, my kind of path on real estate um, coming out of not really coming out of, but uh, when, when I found success in business. So I have, I'm a chiropractor by trade. I started out in 2011 with my own chiropractic clinics, doing it on my own. And the biggest challenge was the tax side of things, right? Um, and so, you know, being able to build up those clinics to the point where they are today to, you know, they're, they're hundred percent debt free, they're cash flowing very nicely, but then you work all year long. And then like three, four times a year, you got to write these large six figure quarterly estimated tax payments. And it just is a, it's a very, it's a big like punch in the gut and big, really frustrating. And so trying to, you know, find that real estate can be that ticket to be able to offset those uh, offset the income with depreciation and and really make a big impact uh, for the for the for the wealth of the family as we continue to move forward. And so you know back in 2018, really kind of making that transition from uh, doing all of my businesses full time to focusing on the real estate side of it, and then of course you know being able to kind of grow the team that we have behind us with passiveinvesting.com, and you know since 2018, being able to acquire just over uh, one excuse me, 1.7 billion in assets and raising just over a half a billion in private equity. And we've sold a few assets. So we're sitting at about 1.3 to 1.4 billion in assets under management right now. Um, and as we continue to go throughout the end of this year and into 2023, there's a lot of different changes happening and things like that. Um, but there's a lot of things that uh, my wife and I have done in our own portfolio, which is what we're going to talk a lot about today. Uh, my wife and I have about 75 different limited partner positions, LP positions with about 18 different operators. And we sat down and actually came up with this list. Originally, it was a, a list of five red flags of things to look for in an investment. And if they're there, then it's a red flag. So these are not yellow flags, meaning that's just a cautionary, okay, I need to know that's there. It's a, if you started to review things and you find one of these things, it's a stop, like a put a big old X on it. Don't waste your time anymore and just put it away, right? That's really what this is for. And it started out with five. And then it ended up being seven. And then now some of the things that are happening in the, in the current market, I actually have an extra one, a bonus one, if I'll call it a uh, number eight one that I've had to add to this list that um, I didn't really think was a big deal because I thought everybody did it. And then now coming into this current market, we're finding out that certain things are not being done by operators, even in good times that really should be making proper decisions to be able to put some safety, uh, some safeguards in place. And that's going to be that, that eighth red flag. Oh, I you way to drop like that a, a little intrigue piece of intrigue for us. <laughs> I can't wait because guys, I don't know what he's gonna say. So this is amazing. Okay, so let's go ahead and kick it off. What are the seven red flags? And then we're gonna kind of dive into each one a little in a little bit more detail. But go ahead and you know, can you list those out for us? Yeah, yeah. So um, the first red flag is going to be you want to make sure that you're investing with an operator that has a successful background in business. So that's number one. Of course, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Each one of these, I'll just list them out first, and then we can kind of dive into the, the ones that we feel like might need some extra uh, clarification. Red flag number two is that you should never invest with a part-time operator. You want to make sure that you're finding operators that are fully vested in the business, that they're giving full-time efforts to monitor and manage your investing dollars. Um, red flag number three is uh, be, being uh, you want to make sure that you are investing with a group that has more than one managing partner, uh, because you once you go once you get to the point of having just one managing partner, things can go awry. And if there's only one person at the at the ship, then who else is going to run it if that person you know uh, something happens to that person, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you know one of the things that we always look for is making sure that there's more than one managing partner. Um, and the red flag, red flag number four is no, if, if I don't invest in a deal unless it has a preferred return. Um, and I might want to make sure that there is a preferred return. So the really the red flag is if there's no preferred return or if there is a preferred return with a GP catch up. Um, and so we can kind of go into some of those nuances there, but that's, that's a big red flag for me is if, if they, if they have no preferred return 
return or if they have a preferred return with a GP catch up. And then number five is uh, operators that are modeling a, a, a refinance in the return projections. Um, it doesn't mean I don't like re refinances. I just don't want it to be the thing that makes the deal work, right? I don't want it to be able to be so tight that in order for it to work, you have to do, and you have to, you have to execute on a refinance um, because I know there's been several people that have done that in this current environment, you know, two, three years ago, and now they're trying to refinance and they can't. And so that's the biggest question mark is, is that the inability of being able to do that. Um, and then red flag number six is all about distributions, right? We want to make sure that distributions are done as return on capital and not of capital. And so uh, the red flag is, is if an operator uh, issues distributions, your monthly cash flow distributions as return of capital would be that red flag. Um, and then the, uh, the seventh red flag, which is the last red flag of the original seven, if you will, is uh, I will not invest in an offering and it, as, as an LP if the operator does not have skin in the game. I want them to be vested in this deal with their own cash alongside me. And, uh, and so if an operator is not putting their money in their own in, in, the, in the deal that they're putting together, I don't want to put my money into it either. Um, so that's, that's the first and that kind of the original seven flags. Mm, no, such great words of wisdom here. Now, I want to um, kind of ask a couple of follow up questions and I want to sure. kind of dive into how these apply to our current economic environment. So and, and we've had these this is based off of you know, questions we've been getting in recently around return on capital and return of capital. So can you go in and kind of pick that apart a little bit for us? Why you want to invest in deals on return of on capital versus return of capital? Yes, yes. So it's a very, you know, uh, you know, it's one letter different, right? You know, on, you know, versus of. It's only really one letter difference, but it, it can make a dramatic impact on your overall returns. And so whenever a operator is giving out distributions as return of capital, what that's doing is it's actually hurting your preferred return because the preferred return is based off of your unreturned capital contributions. And so if you invest $100,000 and then that first year, you've received $7,000 because you had a 7% preferred return and you were able to get that 7% that year. Well, if it's a return of capital calculation, then the next year, you're only going to have 93,000 invested, the 100,000 minus the 7,000. And so now your preferred return is based off of that 93,000 instead of the 100,000. And so it's constantly dwindling down your overall monthly preferred return because because if you're if it's being given back as a distribution of capital, then it's or a return of capital, um, then it's going to be constantly hurting that unreturned capital contribution phase. And so we want to make sure that we're investing in properties that um, they are calculating it as a return on your capital. Now, one little small nuance here is that if it's a really smart operator, um, and I want to say that our group is a smart operator, but if it's a smart operator, what they will do is they will give your cash flow distributions as return on your capital, but for tax purposes, they can calculate it as a return of your capital. And that way you're getting the best of both worlds. You're not affecting the overall distribution schedule and reducing the unreturned capital contributions, which constantly, uh, every time you receive a distribution, reduces that preferred return calculation. But now you're able to still take, it, take advantage of it from a tax perspective at the same time. Mm. Awesome. And that is such a, an intricate topic for investors to really kind of grasp and understand. I know when I first learned that, uh, um, I, I immediately went back and looked at all of my invest in, investments I'm in. I'm like, okay, well, what is the calculation here? And, I'm, and I mean, for the most part, I went, whoo. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that that really can make it, you know, as you said, a big difference on how returns are calculated. Now, well, I, I, well, before we jump off of this, just real quick, Whitney, I was just thinking when you were talking about that, you have to kind of ask yourself, why would an operator want to do it that way? Like, Why would they want to do it as return of capital? And the only thing that I can think about and can think of is that that operator is undercapitalized. And so in order for them to be able to hit their equity splits earlier, they do a return of capital because the, they're going to be able to hit their, their, their splits. Because if they can eventually eliminate that preferred return, they're going to start hitting those return targets for themselves first. And so when I look at that, I look at it as going, okay, they're setting this, this up so that they can be successful. And they're not necessarily looking at it from the investor's purview. 
And that's one of the easy, one of the easy distinctions from, from a lot of different groups is that if you have, of course, that red flag number seven, no skin in the game, then you don't care. But if you have a significant portion of your money invested in these deals, which, you know, with our group, we're usually the number one investor in the, on our, in our assets, um, because we're taking down usually up to 10% of that equity stack, we're usually the largest investor. And so not only do we want to make sure we protect our own investors, but we want to protect our own investment as well as an investor in each one of these, in each one of these assets. And so so whenever we put these different things together and uh, you're looking at these different assets, look at it from like the operator's perspective and figure out why are they doing things a certain way? Are they doing it just to benefit them or are they doing it because they want to be able to have investors that can be successful and will continue to invest with them for many, many generations? Okay, so perhaps you've already answered the question here, but oftentimes when I, as a passive investor, I'm interrogating reality and saying, okay, is this a return on capital versus return of capital? The pushback I get from the operator or potential operator is, it's a, if we're returning your capital early, it's de-risking your investment because we're giving your capital back sooner. Yeah. I mean, and, your and response that to that? I would say that's a talking point, and I would say it's hogwash for for lack of better words. Because you know whether whether you're doing a distribution of capital or, or on capital, you're still giving me capital back. So it's not de-risking anything because um, at that and if that was actually true, then technically at that point I'm getting a zero percent return because all they're doing is risk returning my capital, right? Um, so I, I would say that that's again I, I've heard that. I've also heard that you know it's well, it's better for them from a tax perspective, and I'm like not really because I can still give it to them one way and then calculate it from an IRS perspective as a return you know of their capital so they can get the best of both worlds there um, so I, I would say that you know they just try to come up with you know different you know uh, ideas and theories that that are supposed to make sense but you know to me that doesn't make any sense at all it's just it's just like I've, I've heard operators talk about the no skin in the game thing like they're like well wouldn't you rather us have you know a, a backup and some extra funds do in case the property was going south that we can have extra money I'm like, well, I want you to have both. Like, oh. I don't want to invest with a with an operator that doesn't that doesn't have that is not very well capitalized. I want to invest with a very well capitalized group that has ample operating reserves, not just in the property itself, but between the partners that are part of the project. And I want them to be investing cash into the deal too. All right, I want to pick apart one more of the red flags, and then I want to move into like what kind of how can you what questions can you ask to kind of uncover some of these red flags. So. Um, you mentioned uh, investing in a deal that has a pref, or you don't want to invest in a deal that doesn't have a pref or has a pref with a GP catch up. Um, I think that's another point that most investors really don't quite grasp. Can you kind of demystify that for us? Yeah. So, you know, for those of you who might be new to this, you know, preferred return is where uh, as the investor, you will receive a hundred percent of the cash flows up to a predetermined return target. So for example, in a lot of our properties, we have a 7% preferred return. So um, on whatever assets you're investing in that has that 7% pref, you will receive a hundred percent of those cash flows up to that 7% pref. Now a, a preferred return that has a GP catch up, right? Um, that kind of a, of, a, of a scenario is where you're still getting 100% of the cash flows up to that 7% pref. However, before you get anything else, they go back and say, well, as we're going to go back like as if we were getting a 70-30 split or 60-40 split or whatever the equity splits are all the way back from the very beginning so that we have this kind of equalization of that. So it's basically eliminating the pref at that point because you're basically saying the pref is no doesn't matter. Um, as long as I hit that 7%, then I don't get anything else until we go back and catch up that operator as if we were doing a 70-30 split all along. Um, and the problem with that is, especially with the deals that are happening in the last you know couple of years and even right now, is that the deals have been just so tight that it's very hard to make any of those numbers make sense because it is a significant amount of a catch up when you have multiple years of a preferred return that's lagging from a you know of an equity split perspective on that GP catch up. And so it's just so rich for the operator that it just is very hard for those numbers to make sense. And so what you'll typically see is if you have a preferred return with catch up 
ownership, I can almost guarantee you there is a refinance built into that, that underwriting. Because in order for those numbers to make sense, because they're so tight that the, or they're so, the returns are so low, they go, okay, well, what can we do to increase the returns? Well, let's do it. Let's model in a refinance in year two or three. And hopefully we can do that. And that, of course, pumps up the numbers on the, on the pro forma and the underwriting. So when they present it to investors, everything looks good, right? And mm -hmm. so really a lot of these things, if you find one of these red flags, typically you're going to find multiples of these red flags because a lot of these are intertwined and kind of connected with each other. And, uh, and they, they, they really have an impact on the overall return for you as an investor. So moving into today's environment and what we're anticipating over the next three, six, 12, 18 months, which of these red flags are more important or, or probably are going to play out more, we're going to see more happen more. Yeah. So let me actually give you my, my eighth red flag and then kind of, I dive into that a little bit too. Um, so this is probably a red flag that should have been a red flag for everybody about uh, the, over the last couple of years, really, um, because we were in such a, a tumultuous time over the last several years. But one of the biggest things is making sure that you do not invest in an operator that does not purchase interest rate caps on their floating rate debt. And so there's, 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 I, I, to me, I was like, I didn't even know that was a thing. Like I thought like everybody just did that, right? Like this is just what you're supposed to do to protect your investors, protect your downside and mitigate risk. But what was happening over the last 12 to 18 months is that uh, as we started getting closer and closer to the Fed, increasing the rates, the Fed rates and things like that, there started to be some angst from the SMBC market of these, these interest rate caps. And what was happening is they were getting more and more expensive. And because of how expensive they were, people were basically opting not to buy them. And that's a big no-no, especially right now. I mean, there's some people that were, you know, this time last year paying, you know, three, four percent interest on their floating rate debt. And now they're over 10% interest on their floating rate debt. They can't afford the debt service. They're trying to figure out what's going to what's going to what's happening. They're stopping distributions, they're doing capital calls, and they're they're getting caught with their pants down, is really what they're doing. And it's because they did not buy these interest rate caps. And so one of the biggest red flags that I see that's going to start coming out is these deals that people did not purchase these interest rate caps. And we're going to start to see some of that. But what I will say of the other seven red flags, I think, let me just go through this list real quick. I, I think pr probably one of the biggest things is, is, is being invested with an operator that does not have a successful background in business because I've, I've I actually know of an operator right now. I won't mention his name, um, but he's a younger operator and he purchased, purchased a property, got investors into it. The debt service is too high. He's running out of money. His, 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 his floating rate bridge loan is due at the end of this month. And he's basically folding his arms and doing nothing, you know, almost like, you know, crawling up in the fetal position and, and like crying about it instead of actually just taking charge and going in and making some changes, you know, you know, making some pivots and really trying to protect investors capital because at the end of the day investors, you know, pay us what we do to be to be able to protect their capital in times like this. And if you don't have somebody that knows how to run a business, that knows how to monitor KPIs and set those KPIs and and, and be able to uh, monitor those on a on a regular basis to be able to know when to pivot then it's going to be it's going to really show its ugly face in this time of and when we have these times of of, of angst that are or, or, or you know issues that are coming up from the market. Same thing that we saw during COVID. You know, um, a lot of a lot of operators you know didn't handle that properly, and it's because they didn't really know how to run a business, right? Um, and uh, and so we have to be careful about um, investing with operators that don't have a background in business. But I would say that's probably the key, almost like the keystone of all of these red flags is that successful background in business. And if you, and I'm not saying that's the end all be all, but if somebody has a successful background in business, I'm not saying just a background in business. So hopefully you heard that it's a successful background in business, right? Because we know, we know a lot of people that have run businesses, but they just run them into the ground, right? Um, and whenever somebody tells you that, that they had a, had, that they exited their business, like I've talked to some you know entrepreneurs before and they're like, they're like, I'm like, so how's your business doing? Oh, we had an exit. I'm like, oh, okay. So what'd you sell it for? Oh, no, 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 no. We just shut it down. <laughs> like, well, I guess that is an exit too, right? <laughs> um, they just didn't sell the business. They just, they just shut it down. So if they exited their business, but that's, I guess that's a polite way or a nice way to say it. And if nobody follows up, they think you sold the business or something. Um, but I would say that's probably the, one of the number one things. And then of course, you know, you know, that, that fifth red flag of modeling a refinance, I think is something that we're going to start seeing because an investor, I mean, and, and operators that projected that in this time of the year, they were going to be at this time over the, over the 
probably from the last three to four months up to the next six to 12 months, if they had planned to do a, a refinance, it's going to be very challenging. I mean, there's already floating rate debts that are the floating rate debt options that are bridge 311s that they're coming due this year or next year. It's going to be very challenging for them to be able to achieve the DSCR requirements to unless they put more capital into the deal. So now it actually affects their underwriting even more. So instead of doing a refinance and you're cashing out, like cash out refi that we like to talk about, um, you're now doing a refi, but you got to put cash in. So it's a cash in refi, right? So we not don't really like those things and they're not, they're definitely not as much fun. Um, but sometimes you have to do them because in order to save the deal, you, ha you have to do that. Um, but again, if you have somebody that has a successful background in business, they're monitoring those numbers, they can try to help mitigate some of that stuff, but they can also go, okay, this, this is about to happen. So what do we need to do before we get to the point where we have to lose the property and potentially lose our investors' capital? What can we do to be able to protect our investors' capital at all costs? Mm. Well, this brings kind of two follow-up questions to mind, but I'll, I'll ask the first. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted to do this topic is because I have run into several investors late, lately that are like, I don't have the time to do the due diligence. I don't have time to ask all these questions. That's why I invest passively. And for me, my like every red flag in my head, every alarm bell goes <laughs> off. So, um, and I'm sure you've heard this too. So what kind of mindset or behavior changes that, you know, should that type of investor you know, need to have like in the next, I mean, I would say next like hour, I mean, quite honestly, <laughs> in order to be successful, but like, you know, how can we set them up for success? Yeah. I, I think one of the biggest things is learning to be for one, learn that you, you, I mean, for one, these five, these eight red flags that we've listed out here are very, very easy to figure out. Um, for the most part, right? Um, so let's just kind of go through these real quick and kind of share with you kind of how you can easily go through this because I think you're right, Whitney, that we need to be careful because there are uh, there are investors that you know don't have the time and they don't want to spend the, the, the extra effort to try to figure out, is this the right investment? They just want to be able to trust somebody. And I will say that the majority of our investors have such trust in us that once they've done their due diligence in the beginning, they don't feel like they have to do due diligence again and again and again and again, which is why we have such a high repeat investor rate. We And every project that we put together, we have about 72 to 73% of the investors that are in that deal have already invested with us in the, in the past and they're reinvesting more money. And I think, but in the very beginning, when you're first vetting an operator, you have to ask these questions. But what I wanted to say about uh, you know the trust that our investors give with us it is a big responsibility for us as an operator because we know that they give us that level of respect and that level of trust to be able to you know, put out an offering and they submit that soft reserve, they review the documents, sign off and wire the funds and it's hands off for them. And for us, honestly, we could put together a, a junk deal and present it to our investors and they would still invest with us. And so it's a, it's very, very important for us to make sure that we don't do something like that and that we, we, we constantly check ourselves and make sure that, you know, we are doing things that are best for our investors and best for our own investment dollars or for us as investors alongside of our investors. But it's a big responsibility and, and we do not take it lightly. And, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of operators just don't think about it that way, but, you know, we, we do, we think about that every single time we put an offering together, you know, is, is this an offering that we would want our own capital, our, our parents' capital, our siblings' capital, you know, uh, our friends' capital, our, our pastor's capital, you know, we want to make sure that we can, we can feel comfortable bringing investors into these projects. And we're not just trying to, you know, slide different things in and, and into it, into a deal just because we know our investors trust us. And so it's, it's a very, very important piece to be able to, you know, have that, that level of trust. And we want to make sure that, you know, they, they, that, that they, that our investors understand that, that it's a big responsibility for us and that we put these projects together that that can that, that can set them up for success. Mm, awesome. Okay. Now, hypothetical situation. If an investor here, you know, maybe didn't ask the right questions, didn't know about these red flags, invested in a deal, and the deal starts going sideways or south, what kind of advice would you give to them? <laughs> um, it. <laughs> I, I would say that it's it's definitely a challenging position to be in. I will say that. And it's it's going to probably be a, a hard lesson for you um, because there are some people that, you know, 
put some money into some project that they didn't do their due diligence on properly. And, and it's a little bit more challenging to do that. And, uh, um, uh, I don't, I, honestly, I don't have, I don't have a good answer for that, Whitney, because it is hard. I mean, I, and I have had investors already call me and say, Hey, you know, that's actually how I came up with red flag. Number eight, I had an investor reach out and say, Hey, um, they're doing a capital call. I don't want to put any money in. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen to the deal, but, uh, they didn't put an interest rate cap on now. They can't afford the debt. What do we do? I'm like, uh, well, I mean, sometimes you, you have to play the knee game, I call it, right? You got to get on your knees and pray and hopefully that investment does well, right? And hopefully they, they, they have enough business experience to make the right decisions. And, you know, maybe you're not going to lose all of your capital. You know, hopefully you'll, you know, you at least get your capital back. And, and, and if, you, if, you, if you make a return off of it, great, that might be gravy for you. But even if you don't, you just get your capital back, that could be a good thing. Um, so it's, it's definitely a very challenging thing to go through. And, 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 and I didn't, actually go through these red flags real quick to kind of figure out how to easily do these things. But um, if you want to go through those, we can. can yeah, let's me. do it. All right. Um, so with the first red flag with no successful background in business, this is this is where you just, it's, it's an easy conversation with the operator, right? Because because I would say that most operators that I've talked to are, are pretty, pretty, you know, open to giving you their background and their experience and things like that. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and some operators will tell you about their bad experience that they had in business and it wasn't so successful, but if they haven't had another business since then, that has been successful to prove them, to prove to you that they can be successful, that can be a little bit challenging. But, um, when it, with red flag, number one, and with, with not investing with an operator that does not have a successful background, then it's really easy to ask in the community, ask around, people will tell you, but also just ask the operator and they'll let you know. Same thing with a part-time operator. Ask them, are you holding down a nine to five job and trying to manage this investment? Or are you all in? Are you dedicated? And do you have full-time efforts watching my money every single day? And they'll, they, they, they will answer that question uh, pretty honestly with you. Um, and again, it doesn't mean like every one of the people on the team, if there's like, you know, three partners who all three of them have to be full-time. I don't think so. Like there can be two main full-time people and, and one guy in the background, that's more of a finance person. That's, you know, still maybe trying to get out of his, you know, nine to five CPA job or whatever the case may be. Um, but I want to see at least one or two of those managing partners as full-time people. Um, so I can make sure that I have full-time, um, uh, uh, you know, eyes on my investment. And then red flag number three, same thing, only one managing partner. So all of those kind of first three, you can really do by just asking the, the operator, you know, how many operators, how many managing partners do you have? Um, are you guys full-time, part-time? What are you guys, is this like a side hobby for you? You kind of do it on nights and weekends or what is it? And then uh, any successful background in business that you can share with us. And then with red flag number four, with the, with the preferred return, no preferred returns or the preferred return with GP Ketchup, and then the red flag number five, modeling a refinance um, and the distributions as return of capital or return on capital. Um, those, those three are really um, where I, when I first, I'll, I'll soft commit for an investment. I'll get the PPM documents, which again, they can be a little bit cumbersome because they're usually 100 plus pages. And the only thing I do is I pull up the PDF, I go straight to my search box and I type in distributions and I figure out what the waterfall looks like with the different hurdles inside of that distribution schedule. And it's usually listed out very easily to read. It's usually bolded format. So you can see exactly what's going to happen to the cash flows during the whole period. And then what happens to the cash when we sell. And that's usually where they're going to outline the preferred return schedule, the preferred return with GP Ketchup, as well as any type of uh, classifications of distributions as return of capital or return on capital. Um, they'll usually always explain exactly what they're going to do if they're what's going to happen with a refinance as well, if it is different than the cash proceeds from a sale. They might just lump it all together as like a capital event waterfall, um, but they'll it'll usually always be listed there. Now, I have looked at some PPMs that say nothing about a refinance at all. And I've reached out to the operator. I just sent him an email and said, hey, um, could you send me your underwriting? Now, I like to look at underwriting. I don't like to put it together, but I like to look at it and dissect it so I can find out where that is. But you can easily just send a message to the operator and say, hey, um, are you planning on modeling or is the current underwriting the performance of the asset based on a refinance at some set date in the future? And if they say yes, then, of course, that's that's a red flag and I wouldn't want to invest with them, right? 
Um, so that would be the, the how you figure it out. Number five, number seven is pretty easy. You just ask the operators how much money you put in putting in there, right? And they'll usually tell you, okay, we're putting in a hundred thousand, we're putting in ten percent, we're putting in five percent, we're putting in twenty percent, whatever it is. And after they close, if you wanted to verify that, you can do that. Just you can just ask them how much. What was that final number? And send you wire confirmations. And you know, we we are uh, we're always open to sharing that if an investor wants to see it. Honestly, up to this point, we never have. Um, but obviously, our, our team always gets to see what we put in. So you know, they're actually seeing that money transfer back and forth. So uh, I, I know a lot of investors will ask our team to kind of verify that. And they're like, oh, yeah, I saw, I see the wire right there that came in from, from the partners that uh, are putting the money into that deal. And then, of course, number eight is with that new one is, is really just asking the question to the operator about, you know, are, are, are you buying an interest rate cap on here? Um, most of the time, it's listed out in the... Uh, investor kind of offering documents so you can tell if they actually are purchasing a rate cap. But if it is floating rate debt, they should always, always be buying that float that 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 interest rate cap. And you know, oddly enough, most of the lenders require it. So for me, it's kind of odd that some of these lenders didn't. But sometimes there's some sketchy lenders out there that would prefer to just take the property back at a loss so that they are not at their loss, but at the operator's loss so that they can now have this asset that's now on their balance sheet that they can now sell and turn around for a profit. So there are lenders that are out there like that. And you just have to be careful and they're not looking out for you. They're just looking out for them. So all of that stuff is, is fairly easy to get and uh, obtain. And a lot of it's just a matter of asking the right questions, but really I'm a very busy person and and I know that I don't have a lot of time to sit there and read 100 plus pages of a PPM, but I will always uh, pull up the PPM and search for those ter those terms, the distributions, um, and be able to figure out how they're doing the waterfall so I can get comfortable with it. Um, and, I, and I usually don't invest with an operator unless um, I've been following with them for a little while, kind of know how they operate, getting on their email list. And you know, I'll, I'll ask other people around about, about who they are and when, what their experience is. And you know, I have a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, of a you know, kind of a leg up, if you will, on some of these operators from a uh, uh, being able to talk to them perspective, because I can just invite them to come speak at one of my events or whatever on a panel or something. And I can get to rub shoulders with them and see how they interact. And you know, there are operators that I've met that I that are they're on my do not invest list, right? Um, they're on my I call it my DN uh, <laughs> DNI list, my do not invest list, right? Um, and so you know that's that's definitely uh, something that as you're continuing to look at other operators, you're going to probably have that DNI list as well. Mm, awesome, all great advice. And I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for our Q and A section after after our recording. But there was a there was a question that came in that just really intrigued me, I, and it, we didn't he hear about this on the red flag list. Like if an, if a operator's had a previous capital call, would you consider that a red flag a uh, red flag or not? I would consider it a yellow flag. Um, I would consider it a cautionary flag. So I, I would need more details behind the reasons behind the capital call. Was the capital the call, the call because they they poorly underwrote the deal and didn't have enough money available? Then, of course, that would definitely turn that yellow flag into a red flag. Um, now, if it was like one of their very first deals that they did, and then since then they haven't had one, okay, I can understand that, right? That's, that's definitely going to be a yellow flag. I'm going to ask the questions. Oh, yeah, when we were first got started, we underwrote this deal. It was undercapitalized, and, and we had to you know, do a capital call. Uh, but since then, we've done you know 30 deals. I mean, we've never had to do a capital call. I, I can I can see that, that I would still invest with that, right? Um, I wouldn't just have that a big no-no. But um, if over the last you know six to 12 months, since this last since this investment that I'm looking at, you know, half their deals they've been doing little calls on. Yeah, I'm gonna probably say no to that deal. I'm gonna I'm gonna say no as as a red flag. Um, so for me, it's it's really about trying to make sure we ask the right questions, and, and, and especially with that kind of a situation, because there are also situations where you know it could have been a well, well capitalized deal, and and maybe one of the buildings burned down, or a tornado came through, or a hurricane, and you know they had to do capital calls for some you know unique scenarios that are kind of like you know acts of God. Like I I don't think any operator can completely remove themselves from that risk, right? Um, and so I think a lot of it just has to do with the scenarios behind it and, uh, and, and, and how they actually corrected or interacted with that capital call, meaning, you know, what was the reasons behind it? And then, um, you know, what have they done since then to mitigate that down the road? Hmm. All right. I want to leave, you know, if you could leave the investors with one sage advice from this webinar, what would it be? What do you want them to take away? 
we, we, we have a lot of trust as limited partners that we put into operators. And I feel like a lot of times oper- a lot of times LPs make the mistake of just trying to have too many operators that they're investing in. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't feel like it's prudent to have 18 different operators. I have 18 different operators. I do it for a different reason, not just diversification of my portfolio. Um, I do it because I want to see what other operators are doing, right? To give myself some, you know, insider intel knowledge on what other people are doing. And I get to learn to be able to see what other people are doing because there's some things that people do. And I'm like, you know, that's a great idea. I mean, we should include, include, incorporate that into our investor relations process. Or um, a lot of times it's, oh man, I would never want to do that. And I'm going to make sure I make sure it's clear to our team that we do not want that to happen. So there's a lot of do's and don'ts that we pick up, but I, I think some of the most uh, 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 successful limited partners have found two to three, maybe upwards to four or five good operators that they know, like, and trust. And they just consistently follow them and consistently invest with them because they have built that credibility and that trust with that operator. And again, it, it takes a big level of, 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 of trust to be able to build that relationship with that operator. Um, but I've seen some really successful oper- really successful LPs, these limited partners that have done that, and they have done it very successfully. And you know, I we get phone calls from those people too, and they're like, listen, like for the last three years, you know, we we have not opened up to ha- bring on another operator. We have three operators that we always invest in. But you know, over the last couple of months or last, you know, six to 12 months, we have not seen a lot of deal flow. And so we wanted to add on one other operator to that list. And we've asked around about you. We've done our due diligence. And we, we feel like you're a great group. You have a great track record and, uh, and great business act. Acumen, and we want to add you to our list of operators. And so I think I think that's probably a, a smarter thing to do. And I think that would be a, a big takeaway for people is, is to not try to do due diligence on you know 20 to 30 different operators. Do it on a select group of operators, get to know them, get to know, like, and trust them very well, and just continue to c- consistently invest with them um, and make sure that you can diversify your portfolio within each one of those operators. Hmm, wise advice. All right, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Don't go anywhere because we're about to enter into the Q&A section um, for those of you who are joining with us live. And I just also want to thank um, everybody that's joining us either live or on their podcast of choice. Thank you so much for taking your most valuable resource, which is your time and spending it with us here today. Dan, where can people connect with you if they would like to do so? Sure, sure. Um, the easiest way to do that is through LinkedIn. Um, you can I have it make it very easy for you. Just go to my LinkedIn profile and connect with me there. You can do that by going to linkwithdan.com. Just linkwithdan.com and just go straight over to my LinkedIn profile. You can connect with me there. And then obviously, if you have questions for us about one of our you know offerings or anything like that, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Um, we also have our investor relations team behind us that, that can handle a lot of those questions as well. But uh, glad to be here and glad to be a resource. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we will see everybody next week. If you're here live, don't go anywhere.